Let's break down why we would prefer to use logarithmic returns rather than simple returns for equity analysis. And let's just start off with this simple scenario where you are this little stick figure guy right here and you're going to uh, deposit $100 to the bank. And you're going to deposit that money at a 5% interest rate. We can use this formula right here to determine what will be the future value of that $100 that you deposited at 5%. Let's define what each of the variables in this formula actually mean. So the first one, like I said, is future value, FV. And this is what we're going to be solving for with this equation. We know all of the other variables values right now. So P, that is the principal amount, which is just equal to the $100 that we had initially given to the bank at the time when we uh, put our deposit in. We can also call that present value if we wanted to. And then within this expression, 1 plus R divided by N, R is simply the annual interest rate of 5% that we are currently lending uh, to the bank at. And then N is going to be the number of times that the interest compounds each year. And for a simple deposit like this one, it's just going to be one time per year, like the bank just pays you at the end of the year your interest that you've earned. And then up here, we see T, which is going to be the time in years. And for all the examples in this video, we're just going to assume a one year timeline. Now let's go ahead and uh, solve this formula for this scenario. So the future value is just going to be equal to that principal bound of 100 multiplied by one plus R divided by N, which we know R is that interest rate of 5% and N is one. And then up in the exponent, we will do one times one, which is just one. So we can see that this whole value here is just equal to 100 times 1.05 which is equal to 105 and then so in this case that's really simple the interest rate that we've earned the effective annual interest rate is just five percent because we earned five dollars on one hundred dollars now let's look at an example where we're actually going to borrow a hundred dollars from the bank but this loan that we're taking out compounds interest monthly right and this is going to be at a 5% rate of interest, just like the amount we deposited in the previous example. So we're, we are now going to be solving for the future value of this $100 loan at an interest rate of 5% with a time to maturity of just one year. And here's where things change from the previous example. So everything is the same except for N. And N was the number of times per year that the interest compounds. And so for a monthly loan, like we mentioned above, that's going to be 12 periods of compounding per year. And what that means is that interest can be earned on interest. So let's say at the end of the first month, when we pay our interest or the interest accrues, the interest that is earned that first month will then have interest earned on top of it the second month. And then the third month will accrue interest that was earned from both the first and the second month. So you'll see that the value actually becomes larger and larger the more that we accrue interest. So let's just go ahead and solve this so we can see what it looks like. So future value is equal to the $100 principal times one plus the 5% interest rate divided by 12 compounding periods per year to the exponent of 12 times one. And then if we simplify this, we see that FV just equals 100 times 1.004166 repeatedly to the exponent of 12. And then if we solve for that, we find that FV actually equals $105.12. And so if we divide the 105.12 by 100 and subtract 1, we find that the effective annual rate of interest is now actually 5.12%, which is greater than the original 5% when we only had one compounding period, right? Because we're earning interest on interest. What if instead of looking at deposits or loans, we actually looked at equities? And let's say in this example, we wanted to buy one share of Apple stock for $100. And we can look at this price chart of Apple stock to see how the price change over time. And we can see it's constantly bouncing around and it's constantly updating. 
In this situation, the interest isn't accruing annually or monthly. It's not even accruing every hour or every minute. It's accruing thousands of times every second because the volume on the stock is so high that the, con the stock is constantly trading and the price is constantly adjusting. So with equities, we're approaching a situation where the accrual of interest is nearly infinite, right? So we'll just call that infinity. And this is the case where we are getting towards continuous compounding of interest, which makes this assumption that interest is compounding at an infinite rate. And so let's go back to our formula that we've been working with throughout the course of this whole video, this formula right here. So we can actually rewrite this formula. We can take just this component of the formula here, and we can rewrite it, and we'll know that that part of the formula is actually equal to this. These two are mathematically equal. Don't worry too much about how that math works. Just know that they are. The important part is that once we've got this thing in red, we know that as, as n approaches infinity, this expression, this part in red, approaches Euler's number, okay? And so that approaches e. And so n, if we recall from earlier, is the number of times that the interest compounds uh, per year. And so we're getting to an infinite rate, and e is actually equal to 2.71828. So if we rewrite this formula now, we can say that the future value of this stock is actually going to be equal to that principal, which is the $100 that we want to pay for it, multiplied by e to the exponent of rt, which is going to be equal to 100 times e. And then for r, we're going to stick with that, you know, that 5% interest rate and multiply by the number of years. So t, which is just one. And this actually gives us $105.13, which gives us an effective interest rate of 5.13% annually which is greater than the 5.12% when we used monthly compounding. And so as we approach this assumption of infinity and continuous compounding, we end up with the highest effective annual interest rate possible. Now, one mathematical truth we will find is that the future value is equal to the present value, so PV, which would be our $100 that we invested in the stock, for example, multiply by 1 plus the lowercase r, which is the simple return on stock, which we'll get into more later on in the video, um, which is equal to the present value times e, Euler's number, to the exponent capital R, which is the continuously compounded return on stock. So if we looked at our um, examples from earlier, the simple return would have been the original 5%, and that continuously compounded would have been that 5.13%. Okay, so one thing we can do with each of these three components of this formula now is divide each section by PV and then take the natural logarithm LN. So let's just go ahead and do that and see what it looks like. So the first section FV is going to be LN of FV divided by PV. Now this is quite literally the definition of the natural log return right there. Now let's look at the other sections. So this one is going to be ln, and then it will be PV times one plus that simple rate of return divided by PV. And these two will just cancel each other out. So that's just going to be ln of one plus R. And then this will be equal to ln of pv times e to the r but then we divide by pv and once again these just get canceled out so it's ln of e to the r so now if we write this right we find that ln of fv divided by pv so that natural log return is just equal to ln of 1 plus r and then whenever you take the ln of something, you can basically bring that exponent down in front of it and then cancel the ln and the e. So this is actually just going to be equal to that continuously compounded rate of interest.
Now let's end this brief lesson with a hands-on practical application of using log returns in Excel for an example portfolio that I have listed right here. In this portfolio, we have two stocks. We've got ABC and XYZ. We have one share of each. At time zero, when we started this investment, they were priced at $300 and $100 respectively. Our total portfolio was just the sum of those two values, $400. And then you can see their uh, prices changed like this over the first year, and then their prices changed like this over the second year. Now we want to find how we did by taking the log returns in this table and the simple returns in this table. And the point I wanna make is that log returns are time additive, which makes them extremely easy to work with. And this is why they're highly recommended with equity or stock um, valuations or models in finance. So let's go ahead and calculate these log returns. So stock ABC and year one, what was the log return? We figured out at the end of the conceptual aspect, this is what the log return is here. And it's equal to that continuously compounded rate. So we're going to do equals LN. So the future value would have been the value in year one. And the value that would have been the present value would have been what we started with at $300. And let's close that. And then I'll hit control C. I'm going to paste with a right click formulas. So we can see how it changed in year two which was just the difference from the price of year one to year two using the wrapped in the LN function. And then we take the same values for X, Y, Z, for example, and then we take the same values for our portfolio. And then one thing we can do is find the two year total using this log return. So let's do equals LN. And so the total return in the whole two year period would have been that future value at two years divided by that present value at the beginning, which was 300 to enter. Let's do control C paste formulas. And so now here's the magic of why log returns are so useful. I can just simply set this equal to the log return from year one plus year two, and it matches that two year log return. Exactly. They're both eight points, negative 8.7%. So I'll paste formulas. So all of these match exactly. And so if we do try the same thing with simple returns, we might find a different scenario. So a simple return is just equal to um, that, that future price divided by the present value minus one. So we don't take LN in this scenario. Let's take control C. Let's paste these with a, a right click. And then now we can find the two year total using a simple return methodology by taking that value in year two divided by that value at the beginning and then subtracting one, hit enter, control C, and I will once again paste formulas. And so now let's try to do the addition trick with simple returns. So equals this plus this. And we'll see that they do not match. We can't add these across time. None of them actually match. So when you're using large sets of data, and let's say I'm, I'm looking at daily stock prices, which I do in a lot of my videos, it's much more useful to use, day, uh, to use this log returns methodology because I can sum up from, uh, I can use daily returns and sum them into annual returns by just simply using the log normal method and then multiplying by the number of trading days in a year. So it becomes very easy to use in the analysis. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, and uh, hit like and let me know if you got any questions in the comments. Thank you for watching.